I've met a lot of you before. I'm excited to meet those of you that I have not met yet. Uh, my name is Sarah Robinson. I'm a developer advocate on the cloud platform team. Um, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So that meetup that Amal mentioned in a couple weeks, I'll be speaking there. If you're in, in the area, you should come check it out. Um, you can find me on Twitter at srobtweets, and I recently got my own .dev domain. You all should do the same. Um, it only has one blog post right now, but there'll be more, uh, sarahrobinson.dev. So I'm going to attempt to give you an overview of all of our machine learning products on Google Cloud in 30 minutes. We'll see if I can achieve that. Um, before we dive in, a quick overview of what machine learning is. So I really like this definition of ML is using data to answer questions. Um, so the idea here is that as we provide more and more training data to these machine learning systems, they'll be able to improve and generalize on examples that they haven't seen before. So we can think of almost any supervised learning problem in this way. We provide labeled training inputs to our model, and then our model generates a prediction or label. And the training inputs could be any type of thing. So they could be images to identify a cat. It could also be uh, text. It could be numerical inputs, really anything you can think of. Um, so it may seem like a lot of magic, these machine learning models, like what's happening under the hood. It's actually not magic. Um, all it is under the hood is lots and lots of matrix multiplication. Um, so if you remember y equals mx plus b from your algebra classes, this may look familiar. Um, so the idea is that you want to find the optimal weights and bias matrices um, to get accurate predictions from your model. The great thing about all of the machine learning frameworks that are available in different machine learning tools that we have on Google Cloud is that if you don't want to get down to this matrix multiplication level of machine learning, you don't have to. Um, so I made this pyramid of all of our machine learning offerings on Google Cloud so that you can think about it as choosing your level of abstraction. Whether you're new to machine learning or you're super experienced, have ML models deployed in production, um, we've got something for you to use. So the tools at the bottom of the pyramid um, are catered more towards uh, data scientists and machine learning engineers, folks that have some experience with machine learning. And then as we move towards the top, we have tools that are catered more towards application developers. Um, so at the bottom, we have machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow, which Paige just talked about, um, open source frameworks that you can use to build your machine learning models from scratch. So these are popular frameworks like TensorFlow, XGBoost, Scikit-Learn, and PyTorch. So you can build your ML, uh, ML models at that level. One level up, we have these deep learning VM images on Google Cloud. Um, so what this lets you do is spin up virtual machines with all of these popular frameworks pre-installed. So you don't have to worry about setting up your environment, installing dependencies. Um, you can even attach GPUs and TPUs to them um, to train your models super fast. You're still going to need to think about how you want to serve your models. Um, one, one level up, we have a tool called Kubeflow, which is also an open source framework. Um, Kubeflow lets you deploy machine learning pipelines for pre-processing your data. Um, so you can have... Um, machine learning components in your Kubeflow pipeline for each step of the ML process. You could have one component for pre-processing your data, one for training, serving, um, and all runs on Kubernetes on the back end. Um, and then, still in the custom model side of things, we have Cloud Machine Learning Engine, um, which is an entirely managed service for you to train and serve your machine learning models on Google Cloud. Now we're moving away from custom models. So with BQML, um, it lets you use BigQuery, which is our big data warehouse on Google Cloud. Um, so you take all your data that's in BigQuery, and you can train machine learning models on it with a single SQL query. And then you can also generate predictions with a query. So you just need to choose what type of model you're going to use. You don't actually need to write the code for that underlying model. Run that query, your model's ready to go. One level up, uh, we've got AutoML, which makes machine learning super easy. Uh, this is a product that I'm really excited about. This lets you train and serve custom models, bring your own data. You don't have to worry about choosing the model architecture, writing any of the model code. You just press a train button. Your model's ready to go, available through an API request. And then finally, um, maybe you don't have any training data or you don't have enough training data to build your own model, um, but you want to use some pre-trained models for common machine learning tasks like analyzing images or audio. We have a set of machine learning APIs which lets you do this. You just give it your data, and you get some metadata back from these models that we've already trained on lots and lots of data. I'm not going to cover all of these, um, but I'll give you a quick introduction into these four. So we'll start with machine learning APIs, then we'll go into AutoML, and then we'll look at some custom TensorFlow models on Cloud Machine Learning Engine. 
So let's start with machine learning as an API. Uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have used our cloud machine learning APIs before? All right, looks like about a third. So on cloud, we have a set of pre-trained APIs um, that lets you query machine learning models that have already been trained to accomplish common ML tasks. So you can do things like analyze images, analyze videos, convert audio to text and text to audio, um, analyze that text and translate text into over 100 different languages. I'm gonna show you just two of them to give you an idea of how they work. Um, so the Cloud Vision API essentially will tell you what is this a picture of. Um, it can do all these things. I'm not gonna highlight all of them. It can tell you um, where a face is in an image and the emotions in that face. Um, it can give you bounding boxes of where specific labels are in the image. Um, it can do handwriting OCR, OCR on text. So OCR stands for optical character recognition. So if you have an image of a receipt or a menu from a restaurant, it can identify that text um, the language of that text, and it'll also tell you where the text is in the image. Um, it can identify common logos, lots of cool features of the Vision API. It's just a REST API, so this is an example of what a JSON request would look like. Um, you can pass it a Google Cloud Storage URL of the location of your image, um, or you can base64 encode your image and pass it directly to the API. And then you just tell it what types of feature detection you want to run. Um, as I mentioned, it's a REST API, so you can call it in whatever language you'd like. We have a number of different client libraries to make it super easy. Um, this is an example in Python. Um, so you just import the Google Cloud Vision library in Python. You create an image annotator client. Um, and in this example, we're running label detection on the image. That's the Vision API. Um, the Natural Language API lets you analyze text in these four different ways. So you can extract entities from your text. Um, it'll tell you whether text is positive or negative. If you wanna go a little bit deeper into the linguistic details, uh, you can analyze syntax, and then you can also classify your content into hundreds of different categories. Here's an example in Node.js of calling the Natural Language API um, using our Node.js library for NL. Um, and I wanted to talk about one example of a company that's using both of these in production. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with Giphy. If you're not, it uh, lets you search and share GIFs integrates with a lot of different chat apps. Um, so they are using both vision and NL. They used our vision optical character recognition to improve their search. Um, so before they started using the vision API, when you searched on their site, um, it didn't account for text in GIFs. And as you know, a lot of GIFs have text in them. Um, so they just made a call to the vision API, and now when you search on their site, it'll include GIFs that have that text in them. Their NL use case is pretty interesting as well. Um, they use this to improve the tags on their website. Um, so before what they did is they would just display the most popular tags for a given GIF, but they found that a certain order of uh, parts of speech created optimal engagement for the GIFs. So I can't remember exactly what it was, something like you know, noun, adjective, verb. So what they did was they sent all of the popular tags for a GIF to the NL API, got the part of speech, and then were able to order those correctly um, to display more relevant tags to their users. So the first question I get when I present only on the API is everyone wants to know, these are great for lots of use cases, but what if I want to train them on my own custom data? And that is where AutoML comes in. So AutoML lets you train custom machine learning models for vision, natural language, and translation uh, without requiring you as developers to write any of that model code on your own. This is how it works. Um, you upload your training data to the AutoML UI um, you can either upload it directly to the UI or pass it up as a CSV file in cloud storage. Um, and then AutoML provides a UI for training your data, seeing how the model performed, and then generating predictions with the REST API. So we'll dive right into a demo for this. Some of you may have seen this demo before, so if it's a repeat, I'm sorry. Um, so for this demo, we're gonna, we're gonna show up AutoML Vision, and let's say that I am a meteorologist and I want to predict weather trends and flight plans from images of clouds. Can we use the cloud to analyze clouds? <laughs> and we can, as you probably guessed. Um, so I was, as I was building this demo, I, I learned that there's lots of different types of clouds, and they all indicate different types of weather patterns. So my first thought was, well, let's see if we could do this with the Vision API. Um, the Vision API, as you would expect, it doesn't know the exact scientific names of different types of clouds. So to us, these images look very different. They're obviously different cloud types. Uh, but if we pass this to the Vision API, we get pretty similar labels for both of them, like sky, cloud, blue, pretty much what we'd expect. 
Uh, so I'm going to jump right into a demo of AutoML Vision to show you a model I trained to detect cloud types. Um, so this is the AutoML UI. And here we have um, a view where we can look at all of our training data. So in this particular model, let me zoom in a bit there, um, I'm identifying five different types of clouds, and these are the number of images I have for each one. These are some images that I collected from my teammates and also some public domain ones. So I can go over here to the Train tab, and to train my model, um, I just press this Train button, and I'm ready to go. I've already trained it a bunch of times, as you can see. So we're going to jump to the Evaluate tab, and what we can do here is we can see how our model performed. Um, so a really com uh, an important concept in machine learning is splitting your data. So you take about 80% of your data, and you use that to train your model. And then you reserve part of your data set to test your model on data that it's never seen before. AutoML, luckily, will handle that for you, so you don't need to specify which images are for training and testing, although you can if you would like. So what we get here is this evaluation, this confusion matrix of how our model did on our test data. So ideally, what you want to see here is um, a strong diagonal from the top left. So this is saying for all of the cumulus clouds in our data set, our model tagged eight, almost 89% of them correctly. Um, we can see that it did pretty well. It also shows us where our model messed up. So it looks like Alto Stratus didn't do so well. I can actually click on this and see which images my model got confused on. Um, so maybe those were labeled incorrectly. Um, it's, so the confusion matrix is a really good place to see um, you know, where you need to go improve your training data. And then the best part is generating predictions on your newly trained model. So here I'm going to upload an image of a cloud. Um, our model should classify this as a Cirrus cloud, and we can see how it does. So you can test your model in the UI. There we go. It's Cirrus with 98% confidence, which is pretty cool. I'll do one more. Um, I'll do this one. This is a cumulonimbus cloud. Probably wouldn't want to see it if you were on a plane. That would be not great. Um, and our model is able to get this one with, with almost 95% confidence. So the UI is one way to see how your model did, generate predictions, but Chances are you want to integrate this into some sort of application so that your end users can query the model. So AutoML provides an API for you to do that. And only you have access to this API endpoint. So this is my model ID. Um, so only you or any developers you've shared your project with have access to this model and this specific set of training data. So that is a quick overview to AutoML Vision. One example of how it's being applied is um, the company Zoological Society of London has these cameras deployed in the wild. Um, and all of these cameras have motion sensors. And so before they were using AutoML Vision, they had millions of images of all this different wildlife from around the world. Um, and they had to classify that by hand, which took months. So they built a model trained on AutoML Vision um, to classify all the different species and types of wildlife that they were seeing around the world. Um, and it, because of that, they were able to now spend days analyzing uh, these millions of images of wildlife instead of months. Um, so pretty interesting use case. Um, there's also a video with more details on this. If you just search Zoological Society of London Google Cloud, you'll find it. So we saw one example of um, creating custom image classification models, but images are only one type of data that you might feed into a machine learning model. What about other types of data? like text. Um, so for that, we have AutoML natural language. Um, before I dive into a demo, a couple examples of how you might use it. So let's say you'd want to um, predict the tag or tags associated with a Stack Overflow question. You pass in the title of the question, and your model outputs a tag. One example. Or maybe you want to predict the source of a news headline. I actually trained a model to do this on AutoML natural language, um, and it works really well. So take the title and predict which publication this came from. Um, so the demo I'm going to show is I found this public domain data set of all the bills that have gone through Congress um, from about, I think, 1940 up to 2015 or 16. Um, and the data set includes topic categorizations of about 20 topics for all of these bills. So I wanted to see if we could train a model um, to generate predictions on bills that aren't labeled. So the example here is that for this bill, our model should predict agriculture. Um, for this one, it should predict macroeconomics. So I will go to a demo, skip over here to the NL UI. Um, as you can see, the UI looks very similar to AutoML Vision, except we have lots of text. Um, so these are all of our bills and their associated label. And then these are all of the labels in our data set. So if we go to the Evaluation tab, we can see that 
our model did pretty well on categorizing these. Um, and now we can generate predictions. Um, so these are bills that were included in my test data set, so they were not used to train the model. Um, so this one is about honoring women who have served in the armed forces. And our model predicted civil rights, which sounds pretty accurate with 98% confidence. And we will try out one more. And this one is about government budget. And our model predicts macroeconomics, 99% confidence. So that's pretty cool. Um, so that is an example of AutoML natural language. And just like AutoML vision, you can access it through this easy to use REST API, passing it your custom model ID. Moving right along um, to AutoML Translate. So the current products that are available for AutoML are vision, text, and translation. So translation is the last uh, part of AutoML that I will talk about. Before we get into AutoML Translate, since it's a little bit more complex than the other two, um, I want to talk about why domain-specific translation is important. So um, let's say we have this sentence, the driver is not working. Um, so it turns out this sentence could have lots of different interpretations depending on the domain you'd like to translate it in. So it could be referring to a golf club. Our driver club is broken. It's not working. Um, but it could also mean that maybe it's referring to a taxi driver. The taxi driver is taking a break. The driver is not working. Um, or it could even be referring to a device driver. So it could have software context. Um, and let's say you're writing up a bug report and you say the driver is not working. So if we're using a pre-trained translation API like Google Translate, um, we shouldn't necessarily expect it to know which domain this is applying to. And for a lot of situations, a pre-trained translation API is just fine. I use Google Translate all the time when I'm traveling to different countries. If I want to say something like, you know, what is this food item or where's the train station, works just great. But there are situations where you have a lot of um, industry-specific jargon that you need to translate. And that's where AutoML Translate comes in really handy. I'm not going to do a demo of it since I don't have a ton of time. Um, but there's some videos of me doing demos of it on YouTube, you can check them out. <laughs> um, so that was AutoML. And now I want to move into um, the custom model side of things. So what if you've got a custom task that requ requires more control over um, your model type and the inputs that you're feeding into your model? That's where Cloud Machine Learning Engine comes in. Um, so ML Engine is our serverless platform for custom machine learning models. It lets you build, train, and serve custom models with your own data. A quick overview, so um, it supports four different frameworks right now. It supports TensorFlow, Keras, Scikit-Learn, and XGBoost. Um, it's our fully managed platform for machine learning. So what that means is that it supports training and serving. Um, you can do distributed training with GPUs and TPUs. Um, and then once your model is trained, you can deploy it to ML Engine for prediction. So you can um, get this nice, easy to use API to generate predictions on your trained model. One of my favorite things about ML Engine is that there's no lock-in. So let's say you have a model that's very computationally expensive to train. You can train it on ML Engine, but then you can download it um, and serve it wherever you'd like. Alternatively, um, let's say that your model trains pretty fast, but you want a nice, easy to use API to generate predictions on your model. So you can train your model somewhere else, maybe on premise, um, and then you can deploy it to ML Engine um, to make use of the prediction API. So I'm going to show a demo of Cloud ML Engine. First, I want to introduce what our model will do. Um, so I found this data set on Kaggle. How many of you are familiar with Kaggle? Looks like most people. Awesome. If you're not, you should definitely check it out. Um, Kaggle is a data science platform that's part of Google. Um, so if you are new to machine learning and want to find some interesting data sets, Kaggle has tons of awesome data sets that you can get started with. Um, the particular data set I'm going to use for this example is um, a data set called World Happiness Report. Um, it's uploaded by the UN's Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And what it is is every year um, a couple of economists get together and they've quantified this happiness score um, that they base on a number of different quality of life factors um, and they assign a happiness score to different countries. So the data set is super small, but it's good for this demo um, so that we can train it live. And so what our model will do um, is it'll take these seven values. They're all numerical values, so they've quantified these. Um, and then we want our model to see if we can predict the happiness score for that particular country um, given all of this data. So the Kaggle data set includes data through 2017. Um, so I went to the original data source and grabbed the 2018 data um, and used that to test the model. So what will our model look like? 
Um, so our model will have um, seven neurons in the input layer, because remember we have seven data points that we're feeding into our model. And what makes this a deep neural network is that we have these hidden layers in between our input and our output layer. Um, so our model is a fully connected model, meaning that every neuron um, in the first layer is connected to every neuron in the second layer. Um, now the number of neurons and the number of layers you choose for a model is a hyperparameter. You want to experiment with different, different values and see what works best, what produces the highest accuracy. Um, so the, the output of these hidden layers isn't going to be particularly meaningful to us, um, but our model is using this to find complex relationships between the input and output data. So what we care about is this happiness score, which is going to be a value from 1 to 10. The highest, I think, are in the 7 range. So what are we going to use? Um, we're going to use Colab, which Paige talked about. Um, so Colab is one of my favorite tools for prototyping all ML things. Um, it's a cloud-hosted Python notebook that's available in the browser, colab.research.google.com. You can spin it up right now, get started with a Python notebook. Um, it comes with lots of popular machine learning frameworks pre-installed, along with popular Python data science packages. And the great thing about it is that you get access to a free GPU and TPU runtime that you can use to train your models, which is great. Um, so we're going to use Colab to train our model. As I mentioned, this data set is super small, so I wouldn't really need the scale of GPUs or TPUs to train it. But then I will make use of machine learning engine to deploy my model. So now I'm going to go over here to my Colab notebook. And I don't have a ton of time, um, but I will try to walk you. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Can folks see? OK, yeah, OK. So as you can see, we're connected to the runtime. Um, just to show you how easy it is to use the TPU or GPU runtime, we're using the GPU one right here. Right now, you can just change it to TPU here, and you're good to go. So um, really easy to access free GPUs and TPUs directly in Colab. Um, so I'm not going to talk about what each cell is doing, but I'll, I'll go through it quickly so you get a good sense of what's going on. So here we're just importing um, the different libraries that we're going to use. Um, I'm authenticating so that I can use, I'm already authenticated because I ran this earlier. And what I'm going to do here, um, in Colab you can run shell scripts directly. So I have um, downloaded the data from Kaggle and then I put it in a file in my GCS bucket, Google Cloud Storage bucket. So I'm going to download the data um, and then I'm going to read that data using pandas and we'll print out a preview of it. Um, so this is what our data set looks like. We can see all the different columns here. Um, what our model is going to be predicting is this happiness score. And so that's going to be our label column. That's the thing our model is predicting. Um, we're going to drop a few columns here that won't be meaningful to our model. So for example, let me scroll over. We're going to drop the country column since that's unique for every row. Um, we're going to also drop the rank and the higher and lower confidence intervals, since that would be kind of cheating if we use that to train our model. So we'll drop a couple of columns. Um, as I mentioned, the data set is super small. So here I am splitting it into um, train and test set. I'm using 80% of my data for training, the other 20% for testing. Um, but because it's super small, it'll allow us to train it really fast. So then we will split our data into training and testing. This is an example for one particular country. So our training inputs are these seven values. And then the label that our model should predict is this number right here, the happiness score. Um, so as Paige mentioned, she talked a lot about Keras. Keras is my favorite API to use. Oops, make this a little bit bigger so you can see. Yeah, Keras. It's the best. Um, so as you can see, I just defined my neural network in four lines of code, which correlates exactly with this diagram that I showed here. Um, so it's really easy to see a translation between you know, what I want my model to look like and then the code to build my model. So my model input is seven neurons, those seven values that we're inputting to our model as training data. Um, and then we have two hidden layers, one with 100 neurons, one with 50. And then our output is just one numerical value, the happiness score that our model is predicting. Um, another great thing about Keras is um, I can decide what loss function and optimizer I want to use. So loss is just how our model measures error, how well it did on predicting the value versus what it should have predicted. Um, so I'm using mean squared error here. But the great thing is that I don't have to care about how this is implemented or how that works under the hood. I just tell Keras which loss function and which optimizer. The optimizer is how it will optimize the weights after it calculates the loss. Um, so I just tell it which one I want to use. And here I can see a nice summary of my model. So 
Um, I'm using the tf.data API to feed the data into my model. And I can train it here. I'm going to train it for 70 epochs, which means that it's going to go through my entire data set 70 times. I promise it'll be super fast. So I'm running it here. Woo, there it goes. And it's done. Um, so what we want to see here is loss decreasing as we're training it, which we do get. So loss starts out as 24. And then if we scroll all the way to the last epoch, we get a really small loss number. Um, that's our training loss. What we really care about is our validation loss, or our test loss. Um, so we can see that the loss on our test data is very similar to the loss on our training data, which is what we want to see. The training loss can sometimes be misleading. So if your training loss looks really good, your model may be overfitting to the training data. So the number you really want to look at is the evaluation loss. And now we're going to grab the first five numbers from our test data set and generate predictions. So here we can compare how our model did to what it should have predicted, and it looks like its predictions are very close. Um, I'm going to go back to this code, but what I want to do first is kick off this job to deploy it to our, um, our model in the cloud. So I'm going to call it uh, GDG leads, since we are at this GDG summit. And I'm going to run this command to deploy my model on ML Engine. Um, so this is my model, as you can see, I've deployed this at a, a number of events, so I have a bunch of different versions here. Um, if I refresh this, we should see my new version deploying. There we go, GDG Leads is deploying. Um, and so while that's going, um, let me go back up here to this code to show you what we're doing. Um, so shout out to my teammate Martin Gorner. He has a lot of great TensorFlow resources. Um, he, check him out on, on YouTube. Um, he has a whole series called TensorFlow without a PhD, it's great. So um, I took this from one of his CoLab notebooks. Um, so what we're doing here is we're adding a serving layer to our Keras model so that we can serve it on Cloud ML Engine. And then we're exporting it. So we're exporting it to our local CoLab runtime in this temp folder. Um, and this is what our, mo our save model looks like. We have the save model protobuf file, um, and then we have assets and variables directories. And then with this gcloud command, gcloud is the Google Cloud CLI, um, I can deploy my version, my model, right from the command line. So I'm creating a version. Um, I give it a name. I tell it the name of my model. Um, I tell it the path of where my model files live on my local runtime. And then I tell it the project and the runtime version and the staging bucket where I would like to stage the files for my model. So it looks like it finished deploying. It did. And now I'm going to set this as the default so that we can generate a prediction on it. So I'll set that as the default. Um, and here I have some sample values from the 2018 data set. Um, and we can see here in this comment what our model should predict for those values. And now we are going to call our model. And there we go. So it looks like it got pretty close to what it should have predicted. Um, and you know that I'm calling that model that we just deployed because we set it as the default there. So that's pretty cool. Just a couple of minutes, we've got a trained model on Cloud ML Engine. Thanks. Um, we don't have a ton of time left, so I'll wrap up quickly. But some companies that are using machine learning engine in production, um, one is Rolls-Royce. They have a marine division, which I didn't even know about until <laughs> I heard about this use case. Um, so they're training an object detection model which will return the bounding box of where different Im images are, different labels are in, in an image, um, to track the objects that a vessel can encounter at sea. Um, the second example is Ocado. Um, you may not be familiar with Ocado here, but it's a household name in the UK. Um, it's the UK's number one grocery delivery service. So as you can imagine, they get tons and tons of support emails on a daily basis. Um, and what they did is they built a custom model using that text data to optimize how they respond to customer requests. So they can tell um, you know, whether a certain request is urgent or maybe a certain email doesn't require a response at all. Um, and doing that, they were able to optimize their um, customer service response times. One more thing I want to touch on before I wrap up. Um, this may sound obvious, but it's really important to remember that behind these machines are humans. And as machine learning model builders, we're responsible for the predictions that are generated by our models. Um, so it's really important to be aware of this as you're generating training data sets, 
um, to make sure that your model is fully representative of your users. So just some things to think about to help you with this. Um, is your training data representative of the population using your product? Um, so one example is let's say that I build a model to identify different cat breeds. So I train my model on thousands of images to identify 10 different cat breeds. Accuracy is looking really good. It's like 99.95%. I deploy my model. Um, let's say a user comes along and uploads a photo of a dog. All my model knows are these 10 images of cat breeds. So it's going to try to classify it into one of the labels that it knows. Um, and it might do so with high confidence. So it may say that this dog belongs to this cat breed with 90% confidence. Um, so you really need to think about who's going to be using this model and making sure that it's representative of all of your users. Another place where bias might be introduced is um, in the labeling phase. So since a lot of machine learning models, if you're building it from scratch, requires lots and lots of training data, um, that it'd be really hard for one person to label that data themselves. So often a group of people will help with labeling data um, or it'll be outsourced. Um, so you want to think about who's labeling your data if they might be introducing any biases in the labeling phase. So just an important thing to think about as you're building machine learning models. Um, if you remember just three things from this presentation, I know I covered a ton of different products on GCP. Um, use a pre-trained API to accomplish common machine learning tasks like image analysis, natural language processing, or translation. If you want to train a model using your own data without writing any model code, uh, use AutoML. And for custom tasks, you can build a model with your own data and train and or serve it on machine learning engine. So that's all I've got. Um, here's some links to resources of things I covered. Um, for TensorFlow links, you probably want to stick with the, the links that Paige gave. They're probably the most up to date. I should update this slide with those. Um, so yeah, that's all. I think we may be close to out of time, but I will be at happy hour if you have questions. Would love to chat with you. Thank you.